Thank you very much. I'm Molly Crockett. I'm an assistant professor of psychology at Yale University. In January this year, a video was posted online featuring a group of students from Covington Catholic High School in Kentucky. In the video, the students appeared to be taunting a Native American man while wearing that iconic symbol of the conservative tribe, red hats declaring Make America Great Again or MAGA. Over the next few days, the video clip went viral as members of the liberal tribe expressed outrage on social media. A congressman called for a ban on teens wearing MAGA hats. Celebrities and journalists demanded the kids be named and shamed. Some even wished them physical harm. Then, in the midst of the uproar, a longer video emerged, suggesting the incident was more complicated than originally thought. Here's the New York Times. Fuller picture emerges of viral video. And CNN. A new video shows a different side of the encounter. Some journalists expressed remorse for how they'd reported the story. This one's from The Atlantic. I failed the Covington Catholic test. Next time there's a viral story, I'll wait for more facts to emerge. These mea culpas were met with more outrage, this time from conservatives. And some weeks later, one of the students sued the Washington Post for defamation to the tune of $250 million. Now, this story, just like every story, has unique features. But a lot about this story is starting to feel more and more like just another typical day in America. It seems like we can hardly go five minutes without a new episode of tribal outrage erupting in the public sphere. And if you spend any time on social media, you might feel like we're locked in a state of perpetual outrage. And there seems to be a growing sense that social discourse around moral and political issues in this country has become quite unproductive, and that social media might be at least partly to blame. Now, there are many opinions out there about moral outrage in the digital age. In the wake of the Covington Catholic incident, Twitter was declared the crystal meth of newsrooms. <laughs> Some journalists advocated leaving Twitter altogether. And pundits have even suggested that outrage itself is addictive. But the reality is that there's very little data that bears on these sweeping claims about morality and social media. And gathering this data is imperative, because right now, our government is deciding whether and how to regulate tech companies on the basis of what their products might be doing to our mental health, our social relationships, and our democracy. Just yesterday, representatives from Facebook, Google, and Twitter testified before con Congress on harmful online content. And legislative decisions on this topic in the next few years will change the course of our society, for better or for worse. In my lab at Yale, we've been studying how social media might be changing the way we experience and express moral outrage. Now, what is moral outrage? Broadly, we can consider it to be a mixture of anger and disgust at the violation of a moral standard. Now, people don't just want to sit alone with their outrage. They want to express it. They're motivated to shame and punish the wrongdoer, especially when other people are watching. And expressing outrage is effective in the sense that being the target of shaming and punishment makes people less likely to transgress in the future. Now, the fact that outrage discourages bad behavior suggests one way that outrage could have evolved, by promoting cooperation within social groups. Those groups, with more people willing to shame and punish wrongdoers, would be more successful than less moralistic groups. But in addition to benefiting groups, outrage also benefits those individuals who express it. People who express outrage are more likely to be trusted and chosen as social partners than people who don't. So expressing outrage benefits individuals by boosting their social reputation. And these benefits of outrage and moralistic punishment are encoded in the brain's reward circuitry, which becomes more activated when people punish moral violations compared to when they turn the other cheek. 
Notably, this same brain circuitry is activated when people are craving other kinds of rewards, like delicious foods, or for those people who are addicted, cocaine. These psychological and neural mechanisms for outrage evolved in the context of small face-to-face -face interactions in groups of hunter-gatherers many thousands of years ago, like we heard about earlier. But much of our social discourse now takes place online in much larger networks than ever before in human history. I've been studying the neurobiology of moral outrage for more than a decade, but in 2016, in the wake of Brexit and Trump, I started thinking about how the modern context of social media might be changing the nature of moral outrage with potentially far-reaching consequences for social life. My hypothesis is built around a very simple theory about how we learn from rewards and adapt our behavior. Moral outrage is triggered by stimuli that call attention to moral norm violations. People express outrage with a range of responses that vary in their costs. And expressing outrage leads to a variety of personal and social outcomes, which then reinforce the responses, making them more likely to occur in the future. This simple framework can help us to organize the many ways in which so social media might be changing the costs and benefits of moral outrage. Let's start by talking about how social media alters the stimuli that trigger outrage in us. One feature of social media that's relevant here is its business model. So platforms like Facebook and Twitter make more money the longer they hold our attention, so their newsfeed algorithms prioritize content that draws the most engagement. And research has shown that the most engaging content is emotional content, especially moral emotions. Bill Brady and colleagues recently showed that for a variety of political issues, tweets containing moral emotion words like hate, attack, destroy, are more likely to go viral. So every word like this in a tweet increases its likelihood of being retweeted by 20%. The implication of this is that if newsfeed algorithms are selecting for engagement, this creates an information ecosystem that's promoting the most outrageous content which might be artificially inflating our everyday experiences of outrage. To test this idea, I analyzed some data from a study conducted by Will Hoffman and colleagues. And in this study, about 1,200 participants were messaged on their smartphones at random times, five times a day over three days. And they were asked to report their recent experiences, including whether they had learned about any immoral acts in the past hour, and if so, where they learned about it and how they felt about it. By analyzing this data, I was able to determine where people are most likely to learn about immoral events, or in other words, the kinds of events that typically trigger moral outrage. And what I found is that people are encountering outrage-triggering events more often online than in person or through traditional forms of media like print, TV, or radio. And by analyzing how people felt, when they learn about these immoral events, I found that people experienced more intense outrage in response to events they encountered online than what they encountered in person or through traditional forms of media. So people are experiencing outrage more often and more intensely in response to online than offline content. Next, let's take a look at how social media transforms the expression of moral outrage. If we want to express outrage offline, we have a few options. We can gossip about the wrongdoer, or we can directly confront them, either verbally or physically. And these latter methods, of course, require more effort, and they also carry potential physical risks. But online, we can express outrage with a few keystrokes. We can post angry comments, either directly to the target or to a broader audience. We can do this from the comfort of our bedrooms. And it's clear that all of these responses require far less effort than expressing outrage offline. And the risks of retaliation are, of course, reduced because you're behind a screen or hiding in a large crowd. So if we think of outrage expression as a kind of cost-benefit decision, the hypothesis is that social media reduces some of the costs of expressing outrage. And what this means is that for any given person, their threshold for expressing outrage is likely to be lower 
online than offline. Now, I really want to emphasize this in itself isn't necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's complicated. So reduced costs might mean that marginalized voices find it easier to express outrage and injustice while facing fewer physical threats. I think Me Too and Black Lives Matter are good examples of this. But, on the other hand, reduced costs of expression might also, in some cases, lead to disproportionate levels of punishment. Finally, the way that outcomes are delivered on social media might make our expressions of outrage more mindless or habitual. So, responding to moral viol violations with outrage is the best way to get likes and shares, and these social rewards are delivered at unpredictable times. A pattern of reward delivery that's known as variable reinforcement, and this is well known to promote the formation of habits. Casinos use this kind of reward delivery pattern to keep gamblers hooked on slot machines. So habits are behaviors that are expressed without concern for their consequences. So just as a habitual snacker reaches for the bag of chips without actually feeling hungry, a habitual online shamer might express outrage without actually feeling very outraged. In my lab, we've been exploring all these questions. And to do this, we needed to build a new tool for measuring outrage on social media. We've been collecting tens of millions of tweets from a variety of episodes of viral public outrage, including the Covington Catholic example I, I opened with, as well as the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings, Jesse Smollett's faked hate, hate crime by Trump supporters, Trump's decision to ban transgender individuals from the military, and United Airlines violently dragging a passenger off an overbooked flight. With this data, we've been building an AI that can measure expressions of outrage online. We're calling it the Digital Outrage Classifier, and we can feed it millions of tweets, and it will determine whether each tweet expresses outrage or not. Here are a couple of examples of tweets categorized by our classifier from the Kavanaugh Supreme Court hearings last year. This one, it says, is outrage. And this one, it says, is not. It does pretty well. Using this classifier, we've been testing a hypothesis that the more your social network rewards you for expressing outrage, the more likes and shares you get, the more likely you then become to express outrage in the future. So in other words, if you express outrage today in a tweet and you get a lot of likes and shares for it, does that make you more likely to express outrage tomorrow? Now, this work is still ongoing, it's, it's in progress, so I can't share just any more with you today, but so far the data are very consistent with our hypotheses. And so for the rest of my time here, I'm gonna zoom out and talk a little bit about some of the implications should our predictions continue to be borne out in our data. Now, recall that outrage has both social and personal benefits. We think that social media might be amplifying some of the personal benefits while at the same time potentially reducing some of the social benefits. It amplifies the personal benefits by dramatically extending the reach of moral signals. So, for example, if you hear somebody make a sexist comment and you tell them off for it in person, you only get credit for that from whoever happens to be watching at the moment, which is probably not that many people. But if you express outrage about that same sexist remark on social media, you broadcast your moral character to your entire social network. That might be thousands or even millions of people. And you can expect a big pile of likes and retweets as other people want to chime in and signal that they agree with you. And we think this is especially true in a political context where people want to signal that they are good tribe members to the rest of the tribe. But personal benefits of outrage aside, it remains an open question whether digital outrage is good for society. One potential drawback is a worse ability to coordinate our punishment. If one function of outrage is to point out those actions or people who are deserving of punishment, lowering the threshold for expressing outrage could muddy that signal, making it more difficult for people to align their behavior. If everything is worthy of outrage, effectively, 
Nothing is. Another potential bad consequence is that outrage might be facilitating the spread of disinformation and propaganda online. Bad actors who want to spread this kind of content seem to know, either intuitively or explicitly, that newsfeed algorithms are prioritizing outrageous content. So here are a few examples of Facebook ads sponsored by the Russian government in 2016. You can see how much moral emotional language and outrage provoking language are in these ads. We're currently testing in my lab whether outrage is indeed more prevalent in false news compared to real news. And if this is true, outrage expressions could serve as a potential behavioral marker for disinformation and pro propaganda that's at risk of going viral. Finally, we're looking at whether the social reinforcement of outrage online might explain the rise in political polarization that we've seen in recent years. And there are a couple of different ways that this might happen. First of all, if more politically extreme users are expressing more outrage than politically moderate users, and these expressions get amplified by the newsfeed algorithms, then more moderate users might feel pressure to chime in. And then, of course, they'll get rewarded by their social network. If they internalize these rewards, then over time, this could push people in the middle towards the extremes. But people don't even necessarily need to feel more outrage to appear polarized to their peers. If social media decouples the expression of outrage from its experience, people might falsely believe that others are more outraged than they actually are and be less willing to engage in bipartisan discussions on the basis of these false beliefs. Our data so far suggests that if moral outrage is a fire, Social media is like gasoline. Technology companies have been arguing that their products provide neutral platforms for social behaviors, but don't fundamentally change those behaviors. Of course, this is an empirical question, and the data that we need to answer it already exists, but not all of it is publicly available. These data can and should be used to understand how new technologies, like social media, might be transforming moral emotions from a force for collective good into a tool for collective self-destruction. We'll, we'll be releasing more results soon at digitaloutrageproject.org. You can sign up for our mailing list if you want to follow along. I want to thank our team, Billy Brady, a postdoc in my lab who's leading this work, Killian McLaughlin, our research technician, Tuan Duan, a Yale undergraduate thesis student, our funders, NSF, Democracy Fund, Social Science One, and our volunteers and colleagues who've given us feedback on our work, and of course you for your attention. Thank you.